Welcome to Real Talk for Real Teachers. I'm Dr. Becky Bailey, the creator of Conscious Discipline and a lifelong teacher and learner. For some of you, you may not know what Conscious Discipline is. It's a comprehensive self-regulation program that combines social-emotional learning, discipline, and school culture. So what are real teachers and what's this podcast all about? Real teachers are people who have a life both inside and outside the classroom. I think sometimes in education we forget that we have a real life outside of school. Real teachers at times struggle with their own children, may fight with their own significant others, yell over traffic conditions, and yet show up to work ready to give their heart and soul to children day after day. Real Talk for Real Teachers is a growing community of loving professionals who seek to love themselves as much as they love others. Today, we're going to be talking about disconnected children. Now, disconnected children, as you well know, are dangerous children. And the reason for that is as they disconnect from others, they disconnect the higher centers of the brain the areas we need to thrive and be successful, from the lower centers of the brain, the areas that are needed for survival. Their daily goal is to survive, not to thrive. They do this through attacking, defending, withdrawing, and basically just not caring for others or engaged in learning. Disconnected children are what we call, or what I've often called, is relationship-resistant. And we know these kids. I mean, first of all, they're the most challenging ones in our classroom. They're the ones that send us to all these discipline workshops all over the country. They cause us to Google online and do everything else possible. Right now, children's names are probably popping up in your head. We can also relate to these children. So because many of us have had painful relationships in our own lives where hurt and betrayal was greater than happiness and feeling beloved. And following these relationships, it's hard to keep your hearts open. And we almost declare, we will not let anyone hurt me again. I will not get that close to another human. So as adults, we found ourselves building our defenses and addictions, distracting us from that inner pain. Some of us might just stay really, really busy, Some desperately control others or situations. Some of us lash out or lash in before we even think what a situation might call us to really do. Either way, we become stuck in a self-defeating and self-sabotaging life patterns. So we can relate to these kids in our classroom. We know them on some level. But how do we reach them? So today, I've invited Vicki Hepler who has been an early childhood educator for 36 years and taught in a variety of settings, including pre-kindergarten, kindergarten, kindergarten, first grade, and self-contained special needs. She's a master conscious discipline instructor and created model conscious discipline classrooms in every setting. She's also a wizard, let me tell you, a wizard at reaching disconnected children and dealing with the most difficult. So let's get started now. Welcome, Vicki. Welcome to Real Talk for Real Teachers. Well, I am glad to be here, Becky. I hope that this can be a meaningful conversation that will help a lot of teachers. I'm sure it will. So, you know, 36 years, I guess you've run into a lot of disconnected kids. So before Conscious Discipline, you had these. But let me just go back a minute, Vicki. So in 36 years, have you seen any trends? I mean, are there more disconnected children or less? I mean, what are you seeing happening out there? Well, I find that children are coming into the classroom a lot more disconnected. Many children are coming hurting from trauma, and it really doesn't apply to their socioeconomic status, from my experience. They're just disconnected, which creates a lot more behavior problems in the classroom. And it's across the board, then? Across the board. So before conscious discipline... You had these kids. Now, I'm, what I'm hearing is you're having a few more now. But before before you knew about conscious discipline, how did you see these kids and basically respond to them and how effective was it? Well, my first response when a child came into my classroom, I didn't know they were disconnected. I just saw them as a behavior problem. And my goal was to stop the behavior so I could teach and 
And that wasn't pretty often. Those children, <laughs> those children were excluded by me and by others in the classroom. When I got to the point I didn't know what to do anymore, I called the office. I wanted them out of my room so I could teach. And looking back, that's not how I wanted to respond. That's not why I went into education, but I didn't know what else to do. So, I mean, did you even find yourself at night thinking about these kids? I mean, what could I do next? How could I do this? What could I do different? Did you even, did they get all up in your head like that at night so it was hard to sleep? Or Oh, absolutely. It, it affected not only my relationships in the classroom with other children, it reflect, if, affected my sleep. It had an impact on the relationship with my significant other and with my family. So yeah. it, it was very pervasive. They get into your head. You start feeling like you're a bad teacher, like you've picked the wrong field, that someone else could do it better. And that was frustrating for me at many levels. I was looking for something and a way to do it differently. So I think many teachers can relate to that. I certainly can. So now after conscious discipline, how do you see these kids in uh, what is your more of a what approach are you taking now? And, and, and do you see any impact or any difference in yourself and the kids? Well, first, the first thing that I remember hearing way back before you'd even published the Conscious Discipline book was well, we've known each other a long time. We've known each sure. other a long time, but <laughs> that that for children to behave differently, we have to see them differently and the way for us to see these children differently is to build meaningful connections and relationships with these children. And oftentimes, those children are resistant to those relationships. But with conscious discipline, I realized you don't give up. You find another way in. And once you've got that relationship built, they are willing to comply and you see them transform before your eyes. I found more joy in my job. I found the children who were once behavior problems were now part of the school family. The children in the classroom saw them differently because I modeled that for them. And then those children could see themselves differently. And once they felt connected, then they were able to learn. It was remarkable. So how do you do that? So let's step our, our, our folks through that. So how do you actually do that? Connect to people who don't want to be connected with. I mean, you're trying to make eye, time, eye, eye contact with a kid who's resisting it or touch them and they don't want you to touch them. So what is this process or how do you reach a kid who's going F you and spitting in your face? I mean, this has got to require a phenomenal set of skills on your part. So what are you actually doing? Well, the first thing I'm doing is composing myself. <clears throat> I'm taking a deep breath, many deep breaths, and I am saying in my head, you can handle this. And I'm opening my heart and seeing the preciousness in that child that lays beneath the behavior. That the now, are you behavior able to do this every time? Come on, Vicki. Now, come on. Can you do this every time or, or you have to kind of, you, you know? got You got to build your, your skill set. Yeah. In the beginning, my first response would be my old response. And then I would have to think, wait a minute. I know how to do this differently now. So I would breathe. And once I took those deep breaths, as I approached the child, I found because I was calmer, they calmed. And then I use what we call in conscious discipline. We call it the DNA process. But I described what the child's body was doing. If the child pulled away, I'd say, oh, your arm went like this. And that language elicits the desire for eye contact. And once they look at you, then I take another deep breath, downloading my calm to them. So if they just, so so once you get the eye contact and you take the deep breath, then they're automatically going to start breathing. Has that been your experience? That's been my experience. 
unless the child had a special need that prevented that from happening. And then I would use a different tool to get them to breathe. But for typically developing children, because of mirror neurons, once I took that breath, they would take a breath. And you see this all the time. When you yawn, everyone around you yawns. Yeah. So it's that principle. And then you let that child know that they're safe and that they've been hurt enough. I remember you saying that long ago. Your magic words are, you've been hurt enough. You're safe. I will not hurt you. And once they feel your intent and see that you're genuine, that's the beginning. It doesn't mean the behaviors go away overnight, but then you can be intentional about how you build those connections. And with young children, you build those connections through games, through social games. I had a five-year-old who wanted to play peekaboo because no one ever played peekaboo with this child. So you have to go back and you make it playful. And when you're playful, you're out of your head instead of what if this child tips a table over again. It's you're present and playing with the child, knowing your goal is to build the relationship. You know what you're after. Okay, so let me see if I've got this. So the first thing you said was, so step one is really preparing yourself. So yes. you've got to approach this child with a, a, in, with a calm state, with an intention to help them instead of hurt them. So that's what you said. Then once you get there and arrive to the child, you're going to start doing what you call DNA, which is describing what you see. Your arm is going like this. Your your face is scrunched like this. And then the N, I think you were just going to name it. You seem really, really frustrated. And possibly you were hoping to play longer with your friend or play longer with the blocks. So you do that DNA process, and that's kind of a crack. So that's how you started with a lot of noticing and preparing yourself, and that kind of crack the cosmic egg so that you can wiggle in there and start playing some playful games. Have I got it so far? You've got it so far. Now, for some children, you have to really listen for what's going on in their lives. What family members do they have? What do they like to do on the playground? So you go play that with them on the playground. It's It becomes part of everything you do to build relationship with that child. So you're trying to find some kind of common denominators, exactly. Absolutely. Like maybe they have a sister and you have a sister or... They like football, and all of a sudden, you like football, even yeah. if you don't. I'm going, yeah. oh, let's play basketball. I see okay. you play basketball. You're right. Right. Okay, so backing up a bit, why do you think some of these kids are resistant? I mean, what do you think gone on? Or have you discovered that there's a, a story way behind what you're seeing? Yes, there's the there's always a story. And the story is they have been hurt at a very deep level. Their need for attachment and that early connection was not met in a healthy way. And just like any person that's been hurt, you yourself have been hurt. So you put up a wall. You you have to guard yourself and protect yourself because that's our nature. So these children, they're not doing it to you. They're doing it to protect themselves. And once you can see that, that these children are hurting and they're asking for help and you view them differently, then you respond differently and your connection is authentic. You're not just going through the steps to try to manipulate this child to behave because that doesn't work. (laughs) I tried that when I first started. It doesn't work. So you're actually trying to fall in love is what you're saying, huh? Pretty much. Yes. Pretty much. Okay, so you mentioned a couple things back. You said uh, the school family. So it seems now that we just can't get a relationship with the child when everybody else in the room hates them because, you know, they're scared to death. They're going to throw a table or this or they're so withdrawn they don't even speak. Um, So tell me about the importance of that aspect of the school family. We've got to create a culture that we can plug these kids back in once we find some way to to reach them. How does that work? Right. Well, the school family, the whole message of creating a school family is that we're all in this together. 
And so you're shifting from a culture of competition to a culture of caring, where they're all contributing to the function of the school family, just like a healthy family model. Now, for children, they take their cues from you as the teacher. So being conscious of how you frame the child's misbehavior or this disconnected child's outbursts has an impact on how the children in the school family see that child. So, okay, so yeah, let me just give you, so let's say I'm sitting here, I'm in your classroom and I all of a sudden throw a chair, you know, or I throw a chair down and start screaming. How are you going to frame that? I mean, how is that possible to frame that to the rest of them? What what might be some words you would use? Typically, I would say, boys and girls, so-and-so is having a very difficult time. Let's all take a moment and wish him well. So in other words, they're opening their hearts to try to help him through a difficult time. And then these are the words you say. He felt angry and he didn't know what else to do. Mm, so you're offering positive intent. Now, are you wishing well and breathing or just wishing well part? and breathing? No, because when you have them take a breath, I say, boys and girls, let's all take a breath. Now, from your heart, send all the love in your heart out to this child, Becky, who's thrown mm-hmm. the chair. What and what is does, your what is your response from that? I mean, I mean, the kids are doing this, so you've done it both ways. You've just gone after the child and not included the school family, and you've used the school family to help you. What difference do you see? I mean, is it powerful? Is it phenomenal? Is it minute? I mean, will you no, see this? I th- I have experienced that it cuts the energy of the moment in half so that it's easier to manage. It organizes the rest of the children so they feel safe and they feel they're being of service, which keeps them in the higher states of their brain. And at the same time, now, sometimes the child you're wishing well will respond. Other times they're like, stop, stop. It's okay because that child still feels connected and loved in spite of the behavior, which they've not felt before. And that's why it's so powerful. That makes complete sense. So let's break this down a little bit. So you've, we've shared some things for teachers today. So one, prepare yourself, right? We're going back to that. Take our deep breaths. It starts and, with and you. Yeah, it does. And while people are listening, let's all do it together right now. So everyone take a deep breath with me. So we prepare ourselves. We start seeing the children differently. They're not misbehaving, disrespectful, mean, little heathens. There are people who are out there hurting that are purposefully guarding themselves so that they don't get hurt again. All right. So we see them differently. We see the call for help. We use the school family as a basis of let's all breathe. Let's all help. Let's we're here to help each other be successful. And then you start your noticing process. Now, let's go back to noticing a bit. So one of the things that seems that we have to have this a safe classroom. And I don't know about you, but I've been in situations where I believe people are judging me or actually hear them judging me. And I don't feel so safe with judgment. So how do you remove the judgment from your classroom, Vicki? Um, I remove judgment from my classroom by avoiding words that are judgmental in nature. So it's taking good and bad out of not only out of your vocabulary, but out of the way you view the child. And it's adding language, letting everyone know what's helpful or hurtful, or that someone's having a hard moment. And it's okay, we all have hard moments. So it's about noticing what's before you. Oh, that child threw a chair, not Oh my gosh, the child threw a chair. Call the office. Because if you just notice the chair was thrown and say, the message there is, you seem angry. 
not you're a horrible child. Right. And and I can see how you also added this extra thing that I just heard was how you're building this interconnectedness, this understanding, this, this, this seed of compassion. You know, you've been angry. We've all been angry. So let's not condemn this kid for something we all do. Let's I- I elicit from this child the best of that child so that we are also saying, you know, I, too, get angry, and I'm not a bad person when that happens to me. So this is expanding out just beyond this child and building a a, a sense of we instead of us and them. So I think that's a a phenomenal thing that that is essential to this process. What do you think? I think that that is one of the key elements to reaching relationship-resistant or relationship-reluctant children. Vicki, I know you've transformed a ton of children over your 36 years, but do you have an example that we could hear about a recent child who may have been extremely difficult and how you handled that? Uh, Yes. The first child that comes to my mind is Elijah, and he came to me right at the beginning of the second semester. He was being tracked for an emotionally handicapped classroom. He'd been suspended from his previous school many times. He was throwing chairs, tipping tables, and the administration let me know that they weren't going to be there his first day, but they had people lined up to back me up. (laughs) How old was he, Vicki? He was five. He was a kindergarten student. Yeah. All right. And when I saw him, he was the angriest child I'd really ever seen in all my years teaching. And the power of the school family and connection was so unbelievable with this child. I'll never forget. It wasn't too long, probably within the first four weeks of school, I asked a group of boys, so tell me, tell me about Elijah. And without hesitation, they said, he doesn't know what to do, and we get to help him learn. Wow. And in that moment, I knew that that child was forever changed. Yeah, but, you know, now he had to walk in that first day acting a little odd and throw, you know. Oh, yeah. The first day he walked in, we had a little, you know, we have a greeter who brings him a welcome to our school family little bag with all kinds of stuff. And, you know, he threw it right back at him. (laughs) But I had read um, uh, Schubert's New Friend before he came to the room. I read it the day before. And it's so they were ready to greet him. They They were all set up. They were ready. And I'll never forget. He threw it back at him. And one of them looked at me and said, well, he's like Spence. He just needs time to adjust. (laughs) So, I mean, they... They got it. So what about some other ones? I, you know, did they bring, what about the we care? Did anybody else try to help him that oh, first day? Well, the first day he was very withdrawn, kept his head down, didn't really do much. But the second day he was a little more, um, his, his behavior was a little bigger. He was pulling out scissors and pencils from everybody's school boxes, wouldn't come to the circle. And one child says, I'm going to take him angry. They took him angry. And of course, it flew across the room. Then someone else said, well, I'm going to take him the star pillow. It flew across the room. Someone else said, I'm going to take him the breathing icons. And I said, you know what? You are really trying to be helpful, but Elijah doesn't know what to do yet, and we get to teach him. So I started with that language, you know, right from the beginning. But they were willing to help. They were willing to see him as teachable, not a behavior problem or a threat. That's the power of the school family. That is the power. And I've always said that. You know, you know, you're using conscious discipline when you go in and ask that question. If they can't tell you, because most classrooms you go in, you can say, "Okay, who are the bad kids?" And everybody knows it, and everybody, everybody's parent knows it, and they talk about it at the teacher conferences. But if you go into a conference, a classroom that's using conscious discipline, they have no awareness that anyone is bad. They know there's some children that are hurting, and we need to help a little bit more. But they have just what you said, that beautiful response. And I know that must have thrilled your soul. I knew I was doing it because I yes. remember you saying that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And it, it, and there's, it's like I 
I liken it to a miracle when children can see each other and themselves differently. There is so much power in that. It's transformational. It is indeed. So now, so what if we've got four and five? Now, back of these kids in our classroom, back in the day, I mean, you know, you'd have one or two and you'd think, oh, let me pull my hair out for that. But now these teachers are faced with four and five kids, sometimes six kids in a classroom. What do you what advice do you have for them? I mean, that's a lot of kids who are disconnected, out of control, living in a survival state, you know, with no ability to manage their their own selves. And I've had that situation. Um, you were there videotaping and you've seen no, I was it. There. I've yes. seen it. I've seen and, it in your classroom. That's and, why you the wizard. That's why you the wizard girl. <laughs> but what happens, those who have been the beneficiary of the school family and the relationship, then turn around and serve other children in that moment who are having a hard time. There were two girls in particular that were truly coming from trauma for different reasons. And one the one who had the most difficulty, I don't want to say names, she wrote a poem for the other child who was having a really hard moment and had been sent to the office, was suspended from the bus. But she said, here's what you can do. You can take a breath, go get angry from the safe place, breathe with angry, or go to Miss Hepler or me for help. She wrote a poem. This was a first grader. Wow. So, yes, there are more children, and many days there there seems like more than you can handle. But if you lay that foundation and create that school family, especially the first six weeks of the school year, then all children are more willing to comply because they're in relationship. And you just have to take one thing at a time and keep breathing. So so you're suggesting to them, so we're adding a list of what can be done, right. is that the first six weeks of school is dedicated to building a school family and, and, and with this sense of the safekeeper job. My job is to keep you safe. Your job is to help keep it that way. And then teaching children how to be helpful and supportive of one another. Is that what you're saying? Yes. And in conscious discipline, every child has a job. So every child feels they're contributing to the function of the school family. So that's another important piece. So you've got the safety. Yes, everyone's helping keep it safe, but I'm the teacher. My primary job is to keep everyone here safe. Then you work on the connection and the relationship building. And you do that oftentimes through meaningful jobs where they're being of service to one another in their school family. And then, of course, you have the wishing well we talked about before that shifts every child's view of the misbehavior in the classroom, and it helps cut the energy in half. So what if so now let's let's just take it a little further here. So what if I mean, I'm starting off with five of these little guys or gals in my classroom first day of school. So I'm working on my six-week plan of building this school family and building this interconnectedness, noticing instead of judging and focusing on behavior as not good or bad, but safe or unsafe and helping children learn how to be helpful and be of service to one another, teaching everybody to breathe and wish well. And I'm setting all that up, but I've got five little ones that every step of the day is making it difficult to even create the school family. Now what? Do you have suggestions for that? Yes, I'm very intentional. If I have a child, and if there's five of them, then I have to create moments during the day where I am truly present and connected with them. In conscious discipline, we use I love you rituals as a vehicle to create these connections. So I'm purposeful about connecting with each child in a meaningful way, several times a day, 
I say, if they're calling for love loudly, you got to go in and create moments where there's true you connection. you got to answer loudly, right? you got to answer loudly. The other thing that I use is this noticing formula that you came up with, and it is brilliant. So you're focusing on any time these five children do anything positive or helpful, you use this formula. You pushed your chair in so we'd all be safe walking to the lunchroom. That was helpful. You, If they scoot a quarter of an inch, you're saying, you scooted over so we could get by safely. That was helpful. These children have never been noticed in a positive way because in their experience, because of their behaviors, people are always telling them what they're doing that's wrong. So you're going to shift that. And let me tell you, that is like handing them a golden ticket and Willy Wonka. They are <laughs> in like Flint. <laughs> It works. I'm telling you. Yes, I, I believe it. I've seen it. I've been in your classroom. I've seen it work. So let's just kind of wrap it up here a little bit. So we've got a, a, a kind of a comprehensive approach to this. First, it starts with us, as you've said over and over, and so have I. We have to change how we see them. We have to change how we show up with them. We can't show up angry with eyes that are glaring them down like they've done something horrible. We have to show up with a calm face, a calm body, a calm inner space. We have to create a school family where we're all in this together. We then have to intentionally have our goal is to connect with them, not make them behave. And we've got to find times to do that. And if, and for those listening, if you can't find time during the day because you're it's one of you to so many we've got to find people in a school or if you're in a child care center the someone in the cook or the office somebody's got to reach out to this child or someone's got to cover this class you've got to have those intentional moments and i know vicky you do phenomenal things i had this one teacher who went to the the kid loved football a young guy maybe second grade and she went to his football game after school just to see him play and he couldn't believe that someone would show up and see him play his uh no one had ever did ever did he just was on that team because it kept them busy in the afternoon. So those small things make huge differences. So last advice, Vicki, if you had to say, we were talking to hopefully a bunch of, uh, you know, teachers who have a huge heart, but a heart is is only as huge as our skill set goes with it. So what do you want to leave these teachers with? What can you say? What are, make it maybe two or three things most important. Go. Reaching these relationship reluctant or resistant children really begins with you as the teacher and from and seeing that behavior differently, seeing the child as instead of ruining your day or disrupting your class, which is your natural response, because, you know, it's going to be difficult. It's not easy. But if you can see that child's behavior differently then the transformation is possible and he'll be willing to reach out and connect with you when you reach out and connect with him. And that, you know, that scene of that child that way sets you up for that authentic connection. If you don't see him differently, you can try to fake a connection, but really you're trying to go against your own uh, internal voice that's saying, okay, how can I love this heathen as opposed to how can I help this human? So that's a powerful thing, Vicki. Very powerful. The second is to not give up when they pull away. Sometimes if they withdraw or they pull away, we just let them be. You don't let it be. You keep going in and finding a way to connect with this child. And then the third thing would be use your school family. Create that school family so that the children not only feel connected to you, but connected to one another. And in that school family comes the power to transform these children. And, you know, I've often said I became a teacher not so I could teach everyone to read and write and do math. I became a teacher so I could send better humans out into the world that were loving and kind to make the world a better place. Beautiful. Beautiful. So thank you, Vicki, for joining us today. 
Um, we know this will be helpful for so many and for paying it forward and all your wonderful skills and talents over these last 36 years. You are a gift to so many, especially me. So I appreciate you joining me today. And for the teachers who are, are listening, I want you to just go back and think of the times where you felt disconnected, just in normal day, or you felt a little hesitant to get into a relationship because of your own pain or your own sorrow. And think of the things that might help you during that time. Certainly not to be sent out of the room or expelled or have everybody look at you like, oh gosh, here she comes. So what would have helped you? We don't have to make this so hard and so scientific, but we can reflect on ourselves and say, what would help me? Would a calm, with a calm person approaching me, seeing beha- past all my hurt and pain, forgiving some of the behaviors that I've demonstrated as I lashed out in public, what would help you? And then take those same skills and modify them slightly and offer them to children. So, Vicki, thank you again. Um, we hope to have you back on Real Talk for Real Teachers. Well, it would be a pleasure. And for the rest of you, until next time, I wish you well. For more episodes of Real Talk with Real Teachers by Dr. Becky Bailey, visit ConsciousDiscipline.com forward slash podcasts. You can also subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast app.